Um, this talk contains profanity, so if you've got a problem with that, you're in trouble. Um, I use an enormous amount of slang and idioms, so watch out, he bucks pretty hard. All right. And in a moment, we'll have... Oh, everyone having a good time? Oh, you had to do the engineering for me. There you go. Everyone having a good time? Okay. This crowd, this crowd is not a, okay, okay. Yeah, like that, that, that. I, 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 whenever I do a talk like this, I always like to see like kind of what the crowd is that I'm dealing with, and you're a relatively quiet crowd, but that's okay. I love you anyway. Um, doo -doo 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 -doo. <laughs> that's my coworker. He has a magnificent beard. And I just could not resist taking a nice shot of it. So, literally, that is, uh, that is, my, uh, that is my life. All right. Anyway, let's go with this one. This one's very popular. Um, uh, open, open read only. And then, all right. And then function F5. All right, this is all working. Wonderful. All right, hello everybody, my name is Jason Scott, again, the name of this talk is Last Life, running an online arcade in the era of perpetual copyright. Thanks to, to Imal for flying me out here, uh, to putting me up, to letting me enjoy Brussels and the surrounding area, and it's been a wonderful week for me. So thank you so much for that, I always like to appreciate that. It's also been a pleasure to actually hang out with some of my contemporaries in the emulation and other preservation space because I work mostly alone and I work in a kind of isolated area and I'm an extreme outsider. I guess that's something you're supposed to say. And I uh, really enjoy meeting other people who have different opinions. However, um, there's all different opinions about me. So the real talk of this is it's a me cease and desist um, and I'm going to talk about not just the kind of like running the arcade, but things we run into, and general thoughts on emulation. Okay, so there's two kinds of people in the world right now. Uh, for the people who are in the second set, um, as was said, I work for the Intranet Archive. I was hired by Brewster Kale in 2011, and I was given the whatever title I wanted, and I chose Free Range Archivist, and that means that I kind of just go around acquiring material into the Internet Archive stores. Um, I work for this place, archive.org. To some people, it's the Wayback Machine. That is basically, you know, a collection of websites, but some time ago, we also got into the realm of having materials, so books and movies and sounds, and, and it's gotten rather large. There's millions of books. There's millions of audio. Um, we have billions. Actually, at this point, we're getting up on trillions of pages in the Wayback Machine, saved since about 1996. Um, it's in this nice building that my boss bought because he said it looked like the logo, which is always a good reason. And it's a renovated Christian science church, and so inside is the strangest data center you've ever seen. Um, this is a large area, and in the back are these servers. And so right there is about eight or nine petabytes uh, worth of data. Uh, we have about 26 petabytes worth of data on the property. Uh, we have a couple other locations as well. And we get millions of visitors a day uh, to all the various bits of what we do. So it's a living data center. We use the servers to heat the building. And um, if you work at the Internet Archive for about three years, they give you a little statue. And so there's mine. Um, he's, he's, he's a very happy little guy. Uh, he has black wings because I am often called the angel of death. The reason being that I am the person who shows up when sites are dying or things are disappearing. So I'm kind of, if I show up with the wings, it's like, oh, there's problems now. Um, I've actually received word of two different places going down this morning that I have to deal with. Um, so I also talk in a way that gets different opinions from people. And that's just something that, you know, the archive has basically kind of tried to treat me like Noam Chomsky treats MIT, you know, kind of like, he's there, he's there, but I don't know, what did he say today? Oh, that's okay, all right. So whatever I'm saying here, it generally tends to be Jason Scott saying at the Internet Archive, houses Jason Scott like a small feral tornado and occasionally l releases it when something needs to get done. And something needed to get done when Brewster first hired me in. Brewster said, you know, we did good with books and movies and websites. Oh man, we did websites. But we really fell down on software. And it turns out software is kind of important. 
and people want to deal with software, so could you do something about it? And I said, okay, and it took about two and something years and a lot of volunteers, and I did something about it. And my solution is different than many of the other contemporary solutions for providing emulation to people. It has its pros, it has its cons. I wanna make that clear. It is a joy to be in the room with Klaus finally. Uh, technically, by some sort of designation, we should be competitors, but we're not, and I'll explain why. Uh, our methodologies, our audiences, everything are different, and there needs to be more of us. There's a third group called Olive, who do not have an appearance here. They are doing amazing work. They may get stuff in through the Vince Surf kind of digs them tip, but I would wish, so that makes three major players. I wish there were seven, but at this point we'll settle for the three, okay? I made an announcement a while ago on my blog and this was how boring it looked. And it was this little quiet thing saying, I'm doing some work and I kind of put up some arcade games for playable in the archive. And this was all I put up because I always love putting that one domino out and then watching it just dare, turn into just whatever. And what I had announced was something called the Internet Arcade. So if you went to the Internet Archive and went to the Internet Arcade, you would click on the header of a uh, game and you would be playing that game in your browser subject to some caveats, but it would generally work on most modern browsers in some fashion. So you would go from, man, what the heck is Amadar, to you are playing Amadar in about 10 seconds, or 30 seconds, or 70 seconds, depending on where you lived and how you lived, and I found out the way a lot of people live, which is poorly. And it started to explode out into various press, so lots of press just went, oh my God, oh my God, oh my God, oh my God, and then it hit television. And then when it hit television and it was used as a game show, or when Fox News was reporting on it, then I knew it was a little popular. And I had struck this weird little nerve, okay? And it hurt our servers. So if you look over there, that's the Internet Archive having a good day, and then right when you think it is, that's when Jason shows up. And Jason put something up, didn't tell anybody, and then let it go. And so you see it struggle, smash. I think we, no, maybe we, no. And then fighting internal work, and then, ah, okay. And then we were back up again. And that should have killed all the interest, but you know, it was in the morning, nobody cared. So we ended up with a whole bunch of users. And I learned, don't use uncompressed pings as uh, marquee images to click on because it sends 156 megs to everybody who connected. And that was too much. But using this magic thing, PengQuant, which is a uh, public domain program, or I should say an open sourced program, it is able to take images that were like between 300 and 400K and turn them to three. Uh, it, it was a very, you know, and, and one of the things I always go crazy about is when someone says, well, we just, we can't afford the capacity, we don't, we don't know, and I'm like, have you even run PingQuant? Like, have you even, like, taken a look at your images like we used to in the GeoCities days and say, is this really as big as it needs to be and still get the same impression? And so we took it from 156 megs to 3 megs in that move, and the hamster stayed alive and we, we were living. So, great. And we had three million new people visit us in one week and play video games you know, that week. Three million unique people. And, uh, you know, before I suddenly sit here and take the victory lap for like, yeah, yeah, there's all these other people who can easily get knocked under by some sort of bombastic speaker who's talking about the thing. So um, I, I had people like, the emulators themselves, which I didn't write. And these are people who are slaving away, working and writing these emulation. I mean, we, we talked about them here, but we talk about them like they're kind of a natural force. And uh, you'll, you'll use derisive terms like nerds or obsessives or hobbyists or weirdos. And the fact is, is they are really, really serious about what they're doing. I mean, they range from a hobby program done by computer science to somebody who is sitting with the schematics. You know, at this point, the main team that I work with to do the emulators wants schematics more than anything else. They barely want the ROMs themselves. 
themselves. They want to see the schematics, then pull the ROMs in and apply the schematics against them and see where the schematics lied and then produce the emulation from that. In that way, they've been able to emulate incredibly insane things and, and make it modular and have it work. So a shout out to the emulator people and the volunteers, all the people who I've worked with who have given away their time to make something work for the dream, the mission, the hope. And I'll talk about what those are, but the fact is, is those people didn't have to do it. And I always treat them with respect and I always understand at any time, even if they keep giving me a big steaming pile of code garbage, it came from love. They don't know what they're doing. It's a child that makes a, a, uh, a, a baking tray for you out of paper. They don't know but they love you and they want to do this and they love what's going on. Same thing to the OCD nerds, the people who really, really, really go down into what the disk drive is actually doing, who try to understand why things are there and then to point out flaws in chipsets and interactions and accounting for electronic delay and maybe that's the course. I have seen them slave for three months to figure out why one floppy disk didn't boot right and in doing so completely rewrite uh, an Apple II disk emulation so that it's accurate, where it was just happened to be caught by one weird item. And of course, the creators themselves, the people who we are emulating, the people who are in this room, who are artists and creators and writers, who are making things that are worth preserving in the first place. It's one thing to have a beautiful stage and to ensure that that stage is varnished and kept track of, but without those actors and without those playwrights to put us that stage, it remains that, an empty stage, a booting cursor of no meaning. And of course, to my boss, because my boss, trusts me and gives me agency. Here's how much agency my boss gives me. Some of you might recall in Jurassic Park, there was a series where Chris Pratt is dealing with raptors and he made this pose and it somehow caught, it turned out that he thought he was making an action film, but he was actually making a, a, a pan to, to zookeepers because zookeepers started to create their own version of this piece of work where they would actually pose with various bits of items, correct? And I said, okay, and this thing was exploding over the net, and I'm the fast net guy. Oh my God, this was big news at 5 p.m. It's 8 p.m. We got to get on this. And so my boss, who had no idea what the hell I was talking about, he didn't know who Chris Pratt was. He didn't know Jurassic World had come out. He didn't know what Pratt keeping was, what pound Pratt keeping was, what using hashtags to indicate meme trends was. But when I said, boss, could you do one as well? He did it. <laughs> this internet hero went up and did Pratt keeping. And this to me is kind of an indication of our relationship, the, the trust he shows me when I say, let's do it this way. When he first proposed it, he proposed something very similar to emulation as a service. Why don't we have a machine somewhere and then people log into the machine through some interface and then run it? And I said, no, let's do it incredibly terribly in a way that everybody doubts until it happens, because I like those. And so with, that's actually what we did, right? These items, these arcades, are not running on our machines. We're giving you the data, and then in a JavaScript executable, it's running inside of your browser. So your browser is doing all the work. Thank you for that effort. We're, we're basically telling it, well, it's kind of your job to, to make it run. Uh, we'll give you the software and you'll run. And because of the fact that browsers have become the ubiquitous uh, default way to interact with online experience, and the fact that I found some good emulators that were trying very hard to be good emulators, and there was a terrible, let's be clear about this, terrible, terrible language called JavaScript that had no love, that nobody cared about, so nobody tried to own it and destroy it like we did with Java. It was just a matter of pushing all three together to produce what I call what I called the, the, the JavaScript mess, and which I now call the emularity. And so the emularity project, which is basically to integrate all these JavaScript-based emulators that have been ported over from C using an automatic program called Emscripten, enables us to leave the emulation to the emulation people, the browser work to the browser people, and the JavaScript to the JavaScript people. And when one of those three components disappoints us, we get rid of them and put something else in their place. 
So I don't trust anybody. Everything is aimed against each other in this, in this scenario. Um, so I had actually put up a JavaScript emulation uh, about three months before that announcement. It was called the Console Living Room, and it had thousands of game console programs running on roughly 37 platforms. So everything, as you can see here, the Atari 2600, the Magnavox Odyssey 2, the Bally Astrocade, the Sega Genesis, and also ones you've never heard of. If you've heard of the Entech Adventure Vision, I've already met you. You don't want to know about the Antec Adventure Vision. It produced four cartridges. Its, its display mechanism, I swear to friggin' God, was a 40 by one LED strip with a rotating mirror that would aim the LED against the inside of a piece of plastic. Emulated. Nobody was gonna give this thing love. Anyway, these games went up, people liked them, there was some commentary about them. And people were like, okay, we live in a world where this exists. That's nice. I expected, and I was really waiting for, and it of course still hit me, when I found out that people loved, loved arcade games, and that something about them integrates into the American mind and some of the worldwide mind in such an intense fashion that it's almost their version of patriotism, that it just in invokes this image of Pac-Man, Mario, this is, our, this is our hero, he's come here. So I asked if this was okay to call it this because this was my internal name for it, was Emulation D-Day. And the idea behind Emulation D-Day was, let's put 1,100 games up on the Internet Archive at once, and let's see who dies, who makes it off the beach. And so, again, it, it said 900 because it was still being impacted when some of the news organizations found it, but it was actually 1,100 different arcade games, games you've never heard of, lived among games you've heard of all your life. It was just this beautiful army of, 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 of gaming, and people flipped out. They just passed it along each other. The stories they told, their own past, what this meant. Oh, I'd heard of this. How did this ever sell? What is this? Why is this fun to some people? It, was, it, was, it became at once part of the conversation of contemporary humanity, again, instantly. So um, I got people who wrote me. So um, I'm actually not really allowed to talk about specific conversations that happened, but there were conversations. And so various groups said, we don't see the patriotism of emulation D-Day. And they ran the little uh, bunker and they took the games out. So primarily they did it by saying that they had um, copyright on the idea of the program. They traditionally did not do it on patent because patents had expired. They did it primarily, except for I'd already had a relationship with one of them who basically called my cell phone and said, Jason, what are you doing? And I was like, hi, Andrea, I'm doing things. And she said, you gotta stop doing some of those things. <laughs> so it was nice. One of them responded with basically, like, like a bully, that can't believe you just walked up and took his ice cream sandwich. Like that's basically the tone of it was like, you, do you even know what you've done? So anyway, over that time there was of course removals of various ones and we ended up with 607, which is the current number today. And of course that should be game over. Now there's 607 playable games, playable instantly on the arcade. But it's not quite game over, right? That's not quite really what this was all about. Okay, um, here's the deal, here's the deal. Uh, I'm not gonna ask how many of you are Americans or live under the American system, but the American system of copyright is fundamentally fucking broken. Please be aware of this. This is not a, a subjective idea, okay? This is fundamentally fucking broken. And let me explain why. For instance, no item copyrighted in history that wasn't already licensed under an open license can possibly become 
public domain or have its copyright expire until 2020. If your job at work is to see what's expired this week, you got a great job. <laughs> Just because every day you can write none until 2020, okay? And it's been this way since most of the beginning of this decade. Nothing. Not only that, we have instant copyright. The minute you make something, it's copyrighted. Whatever it is, whatever variation it is, until something bigger comes and destroys you. And additionally, we have cases where copyright has been applied through various means to the control of the operation of tractors, the operation of cars, the operation of configurations of coffee makers. You know, we have this whole situation that where it's grown out of control to the point that, honestly, come on, honestly, we now have perpetual copyright. That's where we live now. And like, and like in a, you know, Charlie going with Lucy with the football, or like the endless help, uh, the endless approach of the person who is just every day thinking that it's gonna get better, we say, well, as you know, uh, when we get to blah, 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 we'll pass a law and we'll fix it. No, we won't. No, we won't. The light at the end of the tunnel is actually, actually three trains. And they are coming for you. And only one of them is lit. And I'm sorry. There's things that are never going to fix. And in America, it's perpetual copyright. We've decided that the entertainment value of America's Hollywood product is more important than anything in the world. Rant over. The point is that I'm not going to, I mean, you can go ahead and ask me the copyright questions. Oh my God, aren't you going to go to Guantanamo Bay? I thought that's what they kept this open for. Aren't you going to, aren't you, escape, aren't you scared? Aren't you, well, if you threaten a person with perpetual years of jail forever, after a while, he's got to go make a cup of coffee and he's got to go for a walk because you can't live under that sort of shock rat system and not eventually go, okay, well, let's just get on to the business of saving old programs because I'm not going to do that. Emulation wins every time. I've heard different opinions on this here. That's fine. I think you're wrong if you don't think that. Emulation is the base end game. It's what's going to win. It's not going to win in the way of it was the best thing. The best thing is it's 1985 and you're 15 and you're playing and you're ripping open electronic arts games for the first time. That's the best situation. We've not worked out the technology to make that happen. Maybe we will, hmm, never know, but we don't have that right now. Right now, the integration of emulation and its constant refinement and the fact that it moves things into a software piece is what makes it work. So I am a huge believer in emulation. Um, so the internet uh, has a lot of different opinions. This is my gif for the internet has a lot of opinions. And it says, oh my God, what about my stuff I made? If you're a creator, and I have this very pithy statement, which is, you are a mouse standing next to the lion of Hollywood, shouting together for the right to hunt antelope. You are acting like you are being given the same power and agency as a Hollywood has. And no, that's not for you. They want you, they want to hold you up and say, look who you're hurting, but that's not what you are. You are a person who lives in a world and things happen in that world and taking part in them gives you ups and downs. And I love people coming up with solutions with a realistic situation, trying to improve it. Um, when we put up items, when we put up things, we make sure that people can contact us and say, I don't like this, and we respect them. If we find that we're infringing against somebody's making money, somebody contacts us and says, oh my God, you know, you, somebody uploaded this and we sell it, can you take it down? We don't fight them, we take it down. We listen to people, right? And you're like, why don't you ask everybody? And I'm like, whoa, because there's millions of people that we have to track down because we did it wrong. We did copyright wrong. And we ended up with a situation where you kind of have to see how far you'll drop when you lower down to the rope in the darkness. 
And I've discovered the drop is about two feet so far. Maybe one day it won't. Maybe one day I'm under the bus. And if you really are going to go, well, you see, I was right, then you're not my kind of person. If you go to bed at night going, well, at least I didn't make a fuss today, then you're already dead. And I'm sorry to be the one to break it to you. Your doctors apparently haven't done it for you. Take a little risk. If you believe in this, if you believe in expression, if you believe people should have access to things. Here's a program nobody cares about. Because one of the things that talks, when people talk about emulation is they talk about games, all right? Now here's my thing with games. The stuff, my attitude right now is that Gamergate with its angry male dominance of bitter hatred and game journalism and game places that have these fake reviews and over play everything and have everything, and the game companies that have created microtransactions and don't realize that that's actually the meanest thing you can do to a human being, they all deserve each other. Like one big search for play, and I hope they have a great time at it. But it's not just about games. Games are a tiny sliver of the software we create. We create utilities. We create items to drive business. We create items to drive machines. We create items to make other items. And in through a lot of it, people hear emulation and they go, mm, well, but this, for instance, is a 386, actually, I believe it's a um, 486 um, benchmarking program that runs a little 3D program and then tells you what your score is. And you can play it instantly on the archive. Or this program that lets you, again, look at how your processor is doing. I don't know why, but I get the funniest feeling when I'm playing a system evaluator inside of an emulator because I feel like the architect from the Matrix. And the program walks in and, and I'm like, the first question, while most imminent, is least relevant. And it just goes, how's the floppy drive doing? And I'm like, the floppy drive, which you perceive, which is merely a set of bits inside of a machine you cannot imagine, which is also connected to pornography and movies, and also to an infinite network of other machines showing pornography and movies, is fine. <laughs> There's actually a program we found, it boots up and goes, whoa, 2015, I'm still running. That's amazing. <laughs> you should do more of that. It turns out it pays off well. Here are some of the roughly seven to 8,000 MS-DOS programs that we're running. We're running something like 20,000 programs for the ZX Spectrum uh, and the Atari and um, a variety of other computers. And here's the thing, I didn't play any of these. I have a script that plays them. Because once emulators are real, machines can evaluate. So this thing connects to them, plays them, takes shots, figures out what it thinks is the best shot, tries to find any text files in it, makes a word cloud of those text files, creates that into a, 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 a what is this program probably about, and then throws it up here. And then I just kind of go through going, whoop, that exploded. Oh, that's terrible. And just move them where they need to be. One of the advantages of being in software is that once you're in software, you're in a machine-assisted world, right? Programs like baby for you which is a program for helping you get through your various trimesters. I got a very low score in this one. Um, or the fact that there's this artwork that's buried in these weird little RPG programs that nobody ever played that people work so hard on. I mean, there's an amazing amount of effort, and you also have drop shadows being implemented in a very strange, odd way from this program from the early 90s. I love this. This is a disk that boots to tell you it can't boot. It boots up and says, no, I I'm, don't boot. <laughs> We've had 12 million new players this year. Uh, the arcade opened up at the end of last year. Since then, we've had 12 million more people show up on the archive. 12 million. So when I hear numbers like we can do this amount or this amount, I'm like, 12 million. And these are not people who have any idea of what's going on. They've had it completely removed. And I want to get this across. All that matters to me, the only, when Brewster said, could you do this for me, I had one idea. And I don't care if Klaus does it first, or if I do it first, or if Olive does it first, or if a person we don't know yet does it first. And that is to turn online and computer history into an embeddable object and make it as boring as hell. 
I want it so boring that you forget it happened, that you forget there was ever a time that it happened that it didn't happen. I want it when you, when you right now tell somebody, I found this recording of the Beatles screwing up a live recording from 1970, you know, just after they broke up. And you're like, what, really? And they give you a link and you hear it. And you either go, that's fake, or oh my God, that's weird, or what's going on with, with George? He doesn't usually play in that tune, but at no point do you go, holy crap, how am I hearing music on my computer? <laughs> oh my God. This is like that thing you did yesterday when you just made that shot show up in my browser in full resolution. You're a magician. I want that for emulation. I want it that, oh, what's in this tab? Hmm, Apple II program. What's in this tab? I should really write back to my girlfriend. What's in this tab? Wow, uh, that Atari 800 prototype that nobody ever released. And it's just there. Interacting with the world, interacting with you, a part of your culture brought back. Enough, by the way, that I don't really worry about being accepted by you. And that sounds cold, but it, let's not make it cold. I don't think that emulation, and I don't think what we're doing needs somebody's approval. Like, I don't think I'm like, well, if you, if you, if you like me, I'll keep emulating. Like, I'm like, we're there. Emulation is part of the landscape, and it's going on, and there'll be variations and advancements, and it'll be wonderful, but we're in a world where emulation is out of the bottle, and it's here. And so I'm focused now not on, oh my God, people should understand emulation. Because Klaus is doing that job for me. Satya is doing that job for me. Um, the gentleman from the first, I'm sorry, I don't have your name. You are doing it for me. You're painting emulation as a tool that needs to be used, like a screwdriver or a compiler. So I'm post-emulation. What does post-emulation mean? It means all I care about right now is bridging the air gap. All I care about is bridging the air gap. That's all I do. I help with the emulation improvements. We just emulated, and by we, I mean another team that produces things that I then claim is my own because I wrote a, you know, a, a description of it, uh, emulated a popcorn machine, which a bunch of people put in money to buy a rare edition of. There turns out there was a Sega popcorn machine that was produced in Japan that has Sonic the Hedgehog making popcorn with a little knob you turn to save him while it pops the popcorn so you have something to do. They rescued it, they pulled out the, the uh, uh, circuit board, they emulated it, and it's in emulation now, and I can have it within an hour up on the archive to play. Like, that happened. They emulated the Ansonic rack-mounted um, synthesizer. They've emulated the digital equipment talker, which was used for the blind and disabled to be able to listen to things. So they're going to emulate microwaves. They're going to emulate walkie-talkies. They're going to emulate scientific calculators. In fact, they kind of already do. That's just gonna happen now. So I'm not focused on that. And I'm not focused on browsers getting faster. Oh my God, they're getting faster. Every month they're getting faster. They're improving, JavaScript's getting faster. None of that, none of that needs me. All I care about now is bridging the air gap which means taking that and making it that. That's all I'm doing. I'm like, we, we sat around, it's like we spent everything up to 1950 not collecting paintings. And we just said, paintings? <laughs> and then in 1950 someone went, paintings seem to have some vague amount of value. And some people are going, well yeah, I thought they were pretty cool, I have a ton in my attic, I got some Vermeers, I got this other thing. And then organizations are now driving around with big trucks going, we should take your paintings. Can we work with you to get these paintings? And we're doing that now with software. Oh, it turns out software has value. And not just to bring Mario back to life. What about the systems that drove mainframes in the 60s? What about the, the, the back end of, of um, CompuServe or America Online? What about the pieces that we use to build operating systems, the dev tools, the parts that fell by the wayside? Hey, it turns out those have value. People are contacting me saying, hey, I got some of these, do you even want them? And I'm like, yes, yes. I went to the um, founder of Voyager CD-ROM. He's given me all his CD-ROMs. I've gone to the founder of Wayzata Technology, the, the founder of um, Walnut Creek Software, makers of CD-ROMs. We have something like six or 7,000 CD-ROMs up on the archive. 
and I don't play gatekeeper. Uh, driver diskettes for printers, uh, first run betas for games. Everything I can do, I'm just absorbing them in now. I'm completely agnostic about it. I get people who send me floppy disks, and this one, for instance, says, yeah, I did some work in Texas in the 80s, and I made some floppies, and I just turned them into images and just put them up on the archive. Because as my boss says, preservation access is what will make preservation live. The access drives the preservation. If people don't get to the thing, if it's not locked behind a license, if it's not locked behind a door, if you don't need a password to go near it, if you don't have to ask permission to check for every single thing that could possibly be of interest to you, people will understand why you might need a grant, an assistant, or the disks that are sitting, which people are giving me out of their attics. So on the left is uh, Apple, on the right is Amiga. The ones on the left have been imaged, the ones on the right are about to be imaged. And then up on the archive, as fast as possible, blow a torrent link on it, we're done there, and turn them all into this. That's all I care about right now. We are so behind. Here's me, I am so sick with the flu, and I am sitting there pulling apart the full run of Walnut Creek software, every revision of BSD, every revision of their weird GIF galore. He's like, this is the one that got us sued. And then there's other ones that are like one off, like wouldn't it be interesting to do this in Japanese? And I'm just like, boom, ISO, 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 ISO. And then I'll leave it alone, and if a nerd wants to, they can do MDF, MDF, MDF. But it doesn't, you know, I first want to encourage the stuff to exist. These are AOL CDs that people have been mailing me. And people are like, oh my God, why would you want that? Why would you do that to us? You've, you've been an asshole up to this point, but I didn't know how far. And the fact is, is AOL CDs were half of all the CDs manufactured in the US for a number of years. They are part of our history. They, are, they have different packaging. They have different software that was embedded on them. They have one-of-a-kind demos. Same thing with um, the cover discs to gaming magazines. We've been putting up thousands of those because there are one-of-a-kind items on that as well. There was a researcher who came to me because she just needed this one version of QuickTime, and I found it on the cover CD of a gaming magazine from about that month. You know, it's got real understandable meaning. Um, so for instance here, one of our items has 1.4 million views. It's been played 1.4 million times. Do you know what it is? It is in fact the Oregon Trail. We've had 1.4 million plays of the Oregon Trail resource game, which was created in 1971, has been created, there's been about 25 different versions, and we have it online. It is our most popular item. This number is not made up. I looked it up three times before I came here. Every second, somebody boots this up through us. Every second, someone starts a game of Oregon Trail. Um, and so it matters to me because I get letters from places like schools who say to me, thanks to you, we used to have one copy and we'd put all 30 kids around it and they would shout out what needed to be done. Well, when you put up 30 kids in a room and make them shout out what needs to be done, the boys win and the bullies win. The ones who are most comfortable in their own skin, who don't get a chance to be anything else, will take over. And the ones who aren't sure who they are yet, who don't have that voice yet, are left behind. And here, everybody gets a shot. Everybody gets to play. Everyone gets to be. These kids don't know from DRM. All they know is they're learning that they can't survive on the way to the Oregon Trail. By the way, the most important lesson of the Oregon Trail is you will die because you just die. And it's not you. If you play it and you die, it's okay. That's what the game was for. So I don't want you to feel any different. This to me is the fundamental bit. Have I really not gone past 20 minutes? Really? Or have I gone past 20 minutes? So I'm, I'm way beyond. You need acknowledgement from the guy. I'm so sorry to Olia for making her wait. If it sounds like this is more of a polemic, if this sounds like this is more of a rant, it's because what's important to me is to realize this world that now exists. Because 
emulation is not just an ideal, okay? You're, 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 you're 20 years late on the idea, but you are five minutes late, on be, or, or I should say five years late, on really being able to squelch it effectively. Like it's over. We can now run an emulator in almost any machine in the world. I walk into phone stores and just run Doom off their phones. I can run into Apple stores and start up spreadsheets instantly. Like I go to hotels and just turn on, just because it's fun. Software of a historical nature is now ubiquitous form. If you are an artist, you should make art that is aware of this fact. And whenever I hear someone say, um, well, yeah, but it doesn't emulate blank yet. I'm like, give us five minutes. Because that's the world we live in. It's a wonderful world. I feel like we're making the world a better place. And I'm sorry that the Internet Archive is one of the few institutions that's stepping forward. At the Software Preservation Consortium that Ben made a reference to, I gave a talk called I Did It 30 Minutes Ago after the Watchmen comic, in which I said, we've been doing this. It's already up, it's already bootable. Why is everybody in this room now scared? Why are you scared? That's the thing that bothers me the most in all this. There should be raging over this and that, and there should be, no, that's not valid history, and what about the, the, the fixity approach? Why aren't you doing that? But there shouldn't be this nervous, what are you doing? They have cameras. They'll see you with me. Feeling I get from people. Maybe you'll be all talking about what a nice guy I sort of was three years from now. Or maybe you'll be with me and you'll help me with this. And I hope you will. Thank you very much.